Thank you very much. Um, my name is Mike Antoni, and over the past 30 years or so, I've been conducting research in behavioral medicine and health psychology, which is essentially designed to identify the role of stress, stress moderating factors, and stress management interventions in patients who are diagnosed with some type of a medical condition, such as HIV or AIDS, different cancers, prostate cancer, breast cancer, cervical cancer, as well as other chronic medical conditions. I also teach PhD students in the Department of Psychology at the University of Miami, and I also teach uh, medical students at our medical school and at our cancer center. Um, I have, over the past three decades, been doing research with Ted Milan, uh, including the development of the MBMD, as well as doing empirical studies to evaluate its validity in different populations. And we have references at the end of this uh, webcast um, in an appendix, uh, giving you a sample of some of those empirical uh, studies that we conduct with patients varying from HIV patients going on antiviral medications to heart failure patients and cardiovascular patients dealing with adherence to their medications, as well as patients with prostate cancer moving through treatment, uh, patients in pain treatment settings, and patients undergoing bariatric surgery. So we've been very interested in how to develop a comprehensive intervention for medical patients, and after we developed it, we've been busy doing a lot of work uh, validating it. Today I'll be covering three areas in this presentation. First, I'll cover some basics about the use of psychosocial testing in behavioral medicine, so as a more general level. I'll then focus on the essentials of the Milan Behavioral Medicine Diagnostic, or the MBMD, uh, how we came to uh, use the subscales that we did in the test, how um, the scores are derived, et cetera, for the various subscales. And then I'll focus on the test report, what does the test actually yield in terms of its scores and in terms of a narrative report that can be used to inform treatment choices. I'll hopefully have time at the end to talk about some of our um, new patient reports that have been designed specifically for bariatric surgery patients as well as pain patients. Before I get started, we'd like to conduct a poll to ask you, have you used the MBMD? So just indicate here whether or not you've used the MBMD, and um, we will then uh, look over the proportion of scores. So far, the no's are in the lead over the yeses, um, but it's a good mixture. It, it looks like it's about two-thirds of the folks have not used the MBMD, and about a third have. And with that in mind, I will keep the presentation fairly basic for those of you who don't have uh, prior experience uh, with the uh, test in your practice. With that, I'm also going to move to um, share mode so that you can actually look at my slides as I present them. And I hope they come through clearly for you. And we're going to start by a little bit of background. The notion of assessing nuances of the medical patient's psychosocial characteristics actually has a long history. Understanding the whole patient, not just the disease that afflicts him or her, was a guiding principle of great physicians of the 19th century, such as Dr. William Osler and Jacob Bigelow. Sir William Osler, for instance, in the 19th century, noted that the good physician will treat the disease, but the great physician will treat the patient. Hence, the idea of integrating as much information as possible about the patient into treatment was already being spoken about in medical circles. In 1835, Dr. Jacob Bigelow defined the great physician as one who not only understands physical diagnosis, but also understands the patient who has that diagnosis. Not all patients with the same diagnosis are the same person. This suggests 
the possibility that medical outcomes could actually differ, even in patients with the same diagnosis. Contemporary surgeons of the 20th century, such as Marc Tournay, have also noted that in the context of doing elective surgeries, such as aesthetic surgeries or bariatric surgery, it's very important to understand the patient's attitudinal factors, expectations, and general psychosocial mix as they move into the decision to get these types of surgeries. A failure to recognize perhaps people who have troublesome characteristics may be a prescription for distress in both the patient and the surgeon. <clears throat> so despite a growing appreciation for the value of integrating information on the whole patient, until recently, acquiring this information called upon the physician's interviewing and communication skills. This is not necessarily the most comprehensive approach to learning about the whole patient. Using the MBMD is one way for contemporary healthcare professionals to recognize potential problems before they can interfere with medical treatment. And today's talk is really focused around the idea that these types of psychosocial assessments can be critically important. There's a lot at stake. Within 21st century medicine, the costs constitute one of the greatest costs of being alive and one that can be affected by patients as well as healthcare providers and the healthcare system. Medical diseases affect millions of lives, but they consume billions of dollars. Healthcare costs for the management of chronic diseases are particularly large given that these diseases are something a person is going to have to live with for 30 or 40 years. A substantial proportion of healthcare costs are for treatment of conditions with psychosocial sources, in fact. And finally, clinical behavioral medicine intervention may reduce the frequency of medical utilization once we can identify patients most likely to benefit. So there's a lot of um, both effectiveness and money at stake in uh, approaching medical care with a comprehensive view of patients. So I'm going to start with some basic questions. I'm going to uh, increase the uh, detail of those questions as I go, but the first basic simple questions are, what are the patient characteristics that predict optical med optimal medical outcomes, such as people's ability to use prevention, and people who respond best to therapeutic procedures. On the other hand, what are the psychosocial processes that might reduce the success of medical treatment? Are they to be found in an assessment of psychiatric issues? Perhaps on attitudes, a person's attitude toward pain, their outlook toward the future, their personality, if you will. Also, it's important to integrate and blend this information with the actual behaviors a patient is bringing to the medical arena. Are they engaging in negative health behaviors? Getting into a little more detail, uh, answering these questions can increase the value, I think, of the health psychologist in the medical setting. And to pretty much read these questions verbatim, what patient characteristics bring people into healthcare settings, and which characteristics do they bring with them into the setting that could actually have an impact on medical outcomes? Which of these can act as an asset or work for the patient or work against the success of medical interventions like, for instance, surgery? If we can answer those questions, the next step would be how can we quickly assess these characteristics in a reliable and valuable manner through a test or evaluation. Finally, how can we use the data that's yielded by that test to make decisions about helping patients modify behaviors, attitudes, outlook, mood, etc., and all the kinds of things that could have an impact on medical treatment. So getting into a little more detail, in our model that represents our approach to identifying the key 
psychosocial factors in health, we first synthesized about three decades of behavioral medicine research. This type of research attempts to draw a correlation between psychosocial factors that are associated with how people stay healthy, that is how they prevent disease, how patients respond when they get sick, their initial reactions, and how people manage long-term illnesses that require them to adapt to limitations. So as you can see here, some of these are the indicators, these bullets. This is what would be done in a research study as one of the variables that we try to correlate with psychological factors. In addition, other types of indicators that are probably more recently uh, investigated have to do with health care delivery indicators. And so we consulted years of research in medical economics and health sciences, which is a branch of science that study these things, and noted direct ties between psychosocial factors and how people utilize the healthcare system by measuring metrics such as ER visits, repeat visits for the same symptoms, length of stay in hospital, and also other healthcare indicators are how successful was the treatment, were there complications, were treatments a failure, were there delays in return to work, that is, how well did the treatment work and how well did the patient recover? Can we draw correlations between psychological factors and these outcomes? Well, there's a large literature, again, that has shown that a specific set of psychosocial factors have been related both to health maintenance and to healthcare delivery indicators. Here I've indicated a set of five different considerations of psychosocial factors that are the chief psychosocial factors that have been identified in this body of research. Within psychiatric conditions or mood-related conditions, certainly is the most widely studied psychosocial factor in health and, and med medical phenomena is depression. Uh, in addition to depression, anxiety-related conditions are also commonly associated with medical outcomes, with health preservation, et cetera. Um, it's interesting that depression and anxiety are probably the most outward signs that alert healthcare providers to the need for further assessment. Unfortunately, many healthcare providers lack the tool to go much further than assessing depression and anxiety. Uh, in the second box are cognitive appraisal. These are what patients think about their medical situation, whatever it may be. Self-efficacy, how much they feel empowered, uh, optimism and pessimism, their outlook, and their perceived control. These three constructs have received a lot of attention in the field and it is really boils down to how patients perceive their health and medical treatments. The next box has to do what, with what patients do, their behaviors, if you will. I've listed a few coping strategies that have been widely studied in health psychology. These include active coping, active behaviors, planning, things like that, avoidance, and closely related to that is denial. And these types of strategies have been related to differential outcomes in health psychology. So together, the, middle, the second and third boxes, uh, what patients think and what patients do, comprise what I would call the patient software for dealing with challenges and dealing with medical uh, challenges. The next box uh, covers resources. Now, this is part of the environment, if you will. It's outside of the person to some degree. It's, uh, the environment offers social, economic, familial, spiritual, and many other types of resources. And these can act as buffers or protective elements as patients go through the stress of uh, medical uh, conditions. A closely related environmental construct is the life context. And this has to do with the milieu in which the patient lives. And uh, you can view the life context as the background noise that they take into the medical 
situation. It may have to do with sexual events that are going on. It may have to do with a pre-existing condition. It may have to do with the job and uh, stress uh, in that environment. So for a comprehensive view, it's important to understand the psychiatric, the patient software, if you will, for dealing with stressors, and also the context in which all of this occurs. This is not unlike the DSM system, which uh, proposes axes. Uh, axis one, as you are all familiar with, uh, has to do with symptom presentation, and it has a corollary within medicine of physical symptoms. So just as a doctor might evaluate fever, cough, pain-related conditions, a psychologist will evaluate anxiety, depression, or dysphagia conditions. And within the field of psychology, we, we denote these as axis one. The patient symptoms occur in a milieu of external and environmental context, which we refer to as axis three and four from the DSM. And these can be viewed as, in medicine, this would be viewed as infectious agents, but in uh, psychology, we would view these as the stressors or the background context in which the axis one conditions are presented. And finally, axis two has to do with the personality of the host or the coping style within medicine. I suppose one corollary of that would be the immune system, where we could have a, an immune system that is underactive um, in medicine, leading to infections. And we could have also have an immune system that's overactive, leading to inflammation and a lot of, and autoimmunity. So the idea of a coping style or a defense system, if you will, in Axis Two is well established in psychology, and it is important to understand that that coping style can offer benefits or liabilities in different situations. So. When we conceptualize the uh, variables that are key considerations uh, along the DSM axes, or whether we consider them within the model that we have been proposing, it still boils down to the basic questions. Which psychological factors can work for or against the success of medical interventions, such as surgery, chemotherapy, medications, etc.? How can we quickly Test these characteristics such that it's a reliable and valid of, of, um, assessment. And all of this, of course, begs the question that we need to use a multimodal instrument that integrates information from multiple domains, and it should be something that is useful for making clinical judgments. 